All right, friends, this is, the, this is the final Sunday in our Common Ground series. If you haven't found Common Ground yet, you've got to hurry. It's your last chance now. Find some Common Ground. We're talking about uh, the fact that we live in a very divided world and asking the question, holding up the question to God uh, with the light of Scripture shining upon it, what common ground do we have left in this world? Where can we find unity together? in the divided world that we live in. So today, I want to talk about this table and the common ground that we find right here. I'd like to read this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. I'll just read verses 10 through 13, a brief but powerful passage here. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. Follow along in your pew Bible. We'll also put the words up here on the screen as well. Verse 10, and and as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, friends, I was, uh, most of you that, that know me know that I was born in a Disciples of Christ pew. Okay, so communion is a big part of my story, uh, very special to me. I have a lot of memories, special communions throughout my life. Uh, I was planning to say everything that could go wrong with communion, I've seen go wrong, and I thought, maybe I shouldn't say that, actually. Spirit might surprise me with its creativity, okay? But I have seen uh, the, the, a tray full of juice, you know, fumbled on the carpet, I've seen a tray full of juice fumbled in the lap of a woman wearing a white dress. I've seen moldy bread. I'm sure you've seen that. I've seen bread that was so hard that it became like a physical comedy sketch when the pastor was trying to break it at the table. Couldn't break the bread. I've seen it all, or close to all. Don't don't tempt uh, the spirit here. And, And I have seen every manner of blessing happen at and happen through this table. Let me tell you, let me just tell you some of my favorite communion stories this morning before we dig into this text a little bit more. One, I was studying at uh, Beijing University in 1998, okay? I was in college studying Chinese at Beijing University, and at that time I had a little silver cross that I wore around my neck, and one Sunday morning I was walking around campus and, uh, and this young man was kind of walking past me, headed somewhere, and, and I, I saw him kind of take, take a double take, do a double take when he saw the cross hanging around my neck. And, and he, he sort of stopped and, and, and turned and put his hand on my shoulder, and he said in Chinese, he said, come, come with me. I was a little dubious at first, had no idea, you know, why he was inviting me to come with him, but I thought, okay, and I followed him. And he led me around this corner, and, and behind a dumpster, maybe I should have stopped right there, but I kept going. He led me behind this dumpster, and behind the dumpster was a circle of about 10 students sitting there. And in the middle of the circle, they had spread before them the elements of Christian communion. Mm. So I sat and partook with my friends at Beijing University in Beijing, China. One time I was living in Chicago, and I went to a college football game in Ames, Iowa, Iowa State University. That was on a Saturday, of course, and on Sunday I was driving back to Chicago, and I realized it was 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and I got curious, and I pulled out my phone, and I looked, and sure enough, there's a little disciples church in Coralville, Iowa, which was about five miles ahead of me, and I thought, why not? So I pulled off and, and parked and went in. And, uh, and I was invited, I, I was warmly welcomed, I felt that same sense of home 
at this table that I've always felt. And I thought, I didn't know I had friends in Coralville, Iowa, but I do. One time I was on a flight, flying somewhere, I don't remember where, and I knew I was going to be flying on Sunday morning, and I had brought a little dinner roll that I had saved, but I forgot to bring juice. And so I asked the flight attendant, do you have grape juice? And she said, mm, sorry, we've got, we've got cranberry juice. Eh, yeah, close enough, right? And so I took this dinner roll and, and the cranberry juice, and I was preparing the elements right there on my tray table when the man sitting next to me said, excuse me, are, are you taking communion? I said, yes. And he said, would you serve me too? And so this gentleman and I shared communion together 35,000 feet. I was the youth minister here from 2002 to 2006. Uh, it's better that we don't remember too much about that time, okay, in my service here, but, uh, but it was a blessed time in my life. I loved, I loved, every New Year's Eve we had a tradition of gathering the youth here for a, a New Year's lock-in, and we would come into this room and start our year, start the new year every year with a service of communion together. That was holy and special to me. One of those summers, while I was serving here in that capacity, I remember serving three weeks in a row of church camp. Pam Van Noy's probably done that at some point in her journey. We have rules against that now. You're not supposed to do that anymore, but at that time you could. Three weeks in a row I served, and I think it was like the Thursday or Friday of the third week when I realized I had taken communion 26 times in three weeks. Maybe, maybe that seemed a little excessive, but I sure did feel close to Jesus, right? The last time I served at this table during that four-year stint in youth ministry here, I thought it was the last time I would ever serve at this table. The Spirit moves in mysterious ways, right? But I remember thinking all week uh, about what the most faithful words might be that I could offer at the table. And I just couldn't come up with any that seemed to do justice to the sense of gratitude that I felt for God and for this church. And so I presided in silence. And I had people tell me that was one of their favorite communion meditations they've ever seen me do. <laughs> he finally shut his mouth, right? That was really good. When I came back in 2014, I continued to find that some of the most precious memories of my life have gathered around this table, uh, certainly in this room, but also times when I've had the blessing of going out and serving communion to, to some of you who aren't able to make it to this room. I would name in particular Bob and Alice Ackerman. Mama's taken communion to them too, and I've never seen anybody receive communion more gratefully and more faithfully than Bob and Alice do when we have the blessing of taking them communion in their home. Probably the most special of all, I've got a, those of you that have been in my office, I've got a Bible that sits on the table in my office. That was a gift from a man named Harold Ware. Uh, it says, Great, Great, Great Grandfather's Bible. It's an 1811 King James. And uh, I went to Harold's apartment, Harold and Betty's apartment, on the day before Harold died to see him one more time and to pray with him and, and Betty. And I, I thought, maybe I should take communion elements with me. And when I got there, Betty told me, you know, he's not able to, to eat or drink anymore. But then she, sh she thought about it for a second, and she said, would you, would you just take some grape juice and put it on his lips? And I did. And I don't know that I've ever felt the spirit of Christ to be more powerfully present than in that moment. Communion is special, y'all. It is special. Now, let's talk a little bit about this. Some of this may be review for many of you, but review is not a bad thing. What is communion? 
What is communion? Okay, why do we why do we do this? Why do we partake? Why do we as disciples of Christ do this every week? Okay, not all churches do that. And how can we find common ground right here at this table? So let's talk about those things. First of all, what is communion? Jesus himself initiated the tradition of communion, instructing his followers to, to take bread and wine. We use juice, of course, and to remember him and his sacrifice. And there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful two-way dynamic here in this. Okay? Jesus participates with us and invites us to participate with him. All right? Support and purpose. We get both of those in and through this table. Support and purpose. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. John 6, 48 through 51 which means that we are nourished by him, that he satisfies us when everything else leaves us empty. He goes with us every day, supports us in our journey, and makes a way for us, okay? And, and through communion, we recognize that we have purpose in being his body at work in the world today, renewing the world in his love. So why every week? Some of you have been part of other movements, other denominations, Christian denominations in your lifetime. Not all Christian churches do this every week. Uh, most, most Lutheran churches do. Uh, quite a few Presbyterian churches do. A growing number of Baptist churches do. But disciples of Christ always have. This has been a centerpiece of our movement over the past 200 plus years. Why do we do this every week? Well, a couple of reasons for that. Okay, uh, the first is scriptural, first is biblical, and, and scripture doesn't issue a, a commandment in this area, it doesn't say you must, Jesus doesn't say you have to do this every week, okay, so I'm not saying that churches that don't are wrong, but scripture does show an early Christian church that appears to do this every time they gather. Right? Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. Right? Acts 2.42 makes it look like every time Christians got together, they would break bread together in the name of Jesus. They saw that every time they did that, it was a chance to be with the living Christ and to thank Him for everything that He has done and everything that He is doing for us. Okay? So, I think, I think Scripture suggests that, you know, this was kind of the pattern in the early church. But I think there's another dimension to this that's really important and meaningful. When I, when I lived in Austin, um, there was a, a young man that I became friends with, and his family had a tradition, a weekly tradition, of getting together every Sunday afternoon for what they called family dinner, okay? A big family and they were kind of spread out all across that metropolitan area. Some lived in San Antonio. And no matter what, every Sunday afternoon, it was understood, you come to mom and dad's house, and we're going to have Sunday dinner together. Now, my friend invited me twice to come and participate with him and share in that meal. And it was really interesting because the first time I came, everybody was in this beautiful, happy mood. They were laughing together, sharing hugs, smiling. I thought, oh, what a beautiful thing. The second time I came, they were all mad at each other. Nobody was talking to anybody, right? It was really awkward for me because everybody was sitting there in silence, eating together. But you know what I thought to myself? I thought, but they're eating together, right? Being mad at each other didn't stop them from coming together. Because they knew what? Being together as family is more important than feeling good about each other on any particular day. Right? We need to be with Jesus. You might feel, you might feel good on a particular Sunday morning. You, you, you might not. Uh, many churches that don't practice communion every week say, well, we don't, we don't do it every week because it becomes less special. You know, it doesn't feel as meaningful if you do it every week. But it's not about how it 
feels in any given week. We need to be with Jesus. It's about meeting with Him, giving Him a chance to speak to us, right? To break us open, to renew us. How often do we need communion? How often do we need to be with Jesus? How often do we mess up, right? How often do we get off track and need to get together with Jesus so He can help us get back on track? Maybe 26 times in three weeks isn't such a bad idea after all, church. All right, back to the text. This text, Matthew 9, comes from a section of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus begins to frame what it looks like to be a new community in him. Okay, over against the way that that was, the old way of being community together. The Pharisees are pushing back because, for one thing, the old way is their business, right? It's their job. It's their their livelihood. They are pushing back and saying, he he is eating with unclean people, right? Now, remember, in the old way, if you wanted to commune with God, if you wanted to come into the presence of God, there was a, a process for this. You had to bring your animal and give it to the priest, and the priest would slaughter the animal and pour out its blood, and the priest would proclaim that by virtue of this sacrifice, you had been made clean, and you could now enter into the presence of God. Okay? And Jesus, Jesus pushes back against that, quotes Hosea 6.6 6 and saying, God doesn't care about your animal sacrifices. That's just going through the motions. God cares about the intentions of your heart. He says, it's not about getting yourself clean so that you can come into the presence of God. It is about coming as you are, bringing all of your sin, all of your weakness, all of your imperfection, coming in authenticity and humility and laying that down with me. You come to me. You don't have to get clean and come. You come to me and I will make you clean. Clean people don't need a savior, he said. Only sinners. Right? And who, who's a sinner? We talked about this last week. Right? Ro- Romans 3 23. Who's a sinner? Everybody. All, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This table. This table is set for all people who would come seeking the love of God. I'll say that again. This table is set for all people who would come seeking the love of God. Whether you are behind a dumpster in China, okay, or in Coralville, Iowa, or at 35,000 feet, sitting in this room at 2109 West Highway 377, sitting in your room at home, worshiping remotely with your church. When we come to this table, we are suspended outside of time and space, bound together with those that have long since physically left this world, bound together with those from all corners of this world today, bound together with all those yet to come in a timeless audience with Christ. And if you squint just a little bit, church, if you look not with your physical eyes, but with the eyes of your heart, you might find yourself, not in this room, but in a simple stone room, second floor, surrounded by siblings in Christ around a low, simple table. You look across that table and recognize that His eyes are looking back at you full of love a deep and boundless love, a love that bears all, that believes all, that hopes all, that endures all, a love that was there 
before there was. And as you look into his eyes, you know that no matter, no matter what, no matter what comes, you will be okay because this love is greater than your weakness. It is greater than your failing. You realize that you are not just you. The boundary lines seem to blur. And you discover that you are me and I am you. We are all one in him. The arguments, the labels fade. And you begin to understand the true meaning of common ground. 